the first call I got was from this firm in Chicago. So I went out to buy some new clothes. I drove my really nasty car, parked it quite a ways away so they wouldn't see it. And for some reason, they were drawn to what they thought they could learn from me. And they said, well, if we decide to work together and we think we'd like to, what, how would you package your service? And I made up a service on site and they said, how much will it cost? And I made up a price at the top of my head as if I'd been doing this for years. And as I drove home, that was the first time I felt like, oh, I could be an expert. Podcasting from Boulder, Colorado. This is the Baby Got Backstory podcast, where we dive into the story behind the story of today's most inspiring storytellers, creators, and entrepreneurs. I like big backstories, and I cannot lie. I am your host, Mark Gutman. I'm Mark Gutman, and on today's episode of Baby Got Backstory, we are talking to David C. Baker, the expert on expertise. Kind of meta, isn't it? All right, all right. Now, if you like and enjoy the show, please take a minute or two to rate and review us over at iTunes. iTunes uses these as part of the algorithm that determines ratings on the Apple charts. And ratings help us to build an audience, which then helps us to continue to produce this show. On today's episode, we are talking to David C. Baker. David is an author, speaker, and advisor to entrepreneurial creatives worldwide. He has written five books, advised 900 plus firms and keynoted conferences in 30 plus countries. His work has been discussed in the Wall Street Journal, New York Times, Fast Company, Forbes, USA Today, Business Week, and Inc. Magazine. And his work has also been featured in the New York Times, where he was referred to as the expert's expert. David helps entrepreneurial creatives make better business decisions about their positioning and marketing and how they structure their roles in the firm, and how to benchmark their financial performance. And we're going to get into that in today's show. His most recent book is called The Business of Expertise, How Entrepreneurial Experts Convert Insight to Impact and Wealth. And he also co-hosts a very entertaining podcast, which is the most listened to podcast in the creative services field, The Two Bobs Podcast, with his partner, Blair Enns. As you'll hear in today's episode, An expert has narrow focus. And for creative firms like mine and yours, David C. Baker is an expert. I've long followed his thought leadership and teachings, and it's a real treat to have him here on the show. And during our conversation, I learned so much from him. This episode is chock full of insight and, well, expertise. I hope you like it. So I'm here with David C. Baker, who is known as the expert on expertise. David, what is an expert on expertise? Oh, it's me. <laughs> That's a smart ass answer, right? It's uh, somebody who helps experts step outside of themselves to help them frame the right positioning for their expertise, to find clients, to help surface and then monetize their IP so really an advisor to experts, that's that's how I think of myself. I didn't come up with that title. It was something that a writer in the New York Times used. And I thought, darn, I'm going to use that. That sounds pretty good. Yeah, I like it. It, it sums it up and it's, it's really concise. And so, you know, when David was was an eight-year-old kid, were you, a, you know, an expert to experts at that time? Or did you think you wanted to be an <laughs> no. expert to experts at that time? What was going on for you? Uh, negative to all of those questions. <laughs> when I was an eight-year-old kid, when I was a five-year-old kid, I was getting dropped into a Spanish, and of course, Spanish was not my primary language, <laughs> dropped into a Spanish kindergarten in San Jose, Costa Rica, and just kind of learned on the fly. I, I, I see parents teaching their kids how to swim by dropping them in the pool. And I've I've always wanted to do that with somebody else's kid, not my own. And uh, just to see, see what happens, right? And, and that's kind of what happened for me. My parents were medical missionaries. And so they needed, they were US citizens. They needed to learn Spanish. So they took me to uh, Costa Rica with them for the year while they learned it. And I got in a Spanish kindergarten. And then when we were six, we went to live with this tribe of Mayan Indians way up in the mountains of Guatemala. It's very, very primitive. 
And here I am with my parents and my one brother, the other brother hadn't been born yet. And I'm just trying to figure out the world. I didn't know the U.S. existed. I was about as far from being an expert as you could be, I think. Yeah. And so take us back there a little bit. I mean, what was life like there? I mean, did you have, you know, modern amenities? Were you kind of in the proverbial uh, thatch hut and dirt floor? Like what, what was your living, <laughs> what were your living conditions? <laughs> well, we lived in a, it was a, a wooden frame house on top of an adobe. So the first floor was an adobe home. And then the second floor was um, a wooden framed home. And this was with this tribe of, there were 20,000 Mayan Indians of this particular Hanhobal tribe, they were called. And we lived in this village and there was no running water. There was no electricity there. The roads were sort of dirt paths and there were no stores to speak of. So it was very, I mean, it didn't, it just felt normal at the time until I moved to the U.S. I didn't really realize that it was very, very primitive. We grew all our own stuff and uh, made everything from scratch and it was where I learned really to be a little bit more self-sufficient and to be grateful with simpler things. I've been completely spoiled at the other end of the spectrum now, but at the time it was a fantastic, it was one of those th where you could envision sending your kid off to camp, right? But this is the way we lived all the time. And it was so formative for me. I'm still discovering ways in which those early days have shaped me for sure. Yeah. And so what were some of those ways? I mean, what really influenced you? I mean, you know, I think it's common as we get older to really trace back our, our influences, our roots. I mean, I know I have a ton. My, my version of your story was, you know, Thrasher magazine and skateboards, you know, that's what, right. that's, that's what shaped me. Uh, and then I eventually took me out to California, but, um, uh, for you, what was going on in Costa Rica with this completely different culture? I mean, what, what were you picking up on? So I think some of those early forces that shaped who I am. I, I'm an introvert. I don't know if that was picked up environmentally or not, but there weren't many kids like me. So I spent a lot of time myself. I certainly loved enjoying, I, I loved reading. I loved to build things. I understood at a very deep level how important it was to think about the future and to be prepared because you didn't know really what was coming. There might be a hurricane that would hit and close off the paths to the bigger city. The bigger city was a five and a half hour drive away, 60 miles. And then, so you'd, you'd basically have to figure out how to eat without getting to any of those stores, figure out how to refrigerate things. If you decided to kill a cow, like how are you gonna keep this meat for a while? So just some basic self-sufficiency without some of the assumptions that come along with it. I think also just the role of education, formal education in our lives. I didn't go to formal school except for a couple years until I was in 10th grade, came to the U.S. So in 78, I guess that was. And I don't really feel like I missed much. I mean, I missed a little bit of the socialization that comes, but... I think there's something about the modern educational experience is a mix of taking care of kids and babysitting them and educating them. And we're certainly realizing that in COVID-19, right, where parents, uh, they're not just missing the fact that their kids may not be learning as well, but they're missing the fact that somebody else is taking care of their kids too. So all of those things really influenced me all the way up to things like I hear phrases bounced around in our modern economy, things like, just follow your heart and success will come. And I'm thinking, wait, that's just bullshit. Like that only works in a developed economy. It doesn't work across the world. You have all these other people, they can't, they know what's on their heart, but they can't afford just to follow that. They've got to go out in the field and work hard just so they can eat. And if they have extra time and money or things to trade, then they can do other things. But we have, de we, we, we've developed a unique way of looking at things that build so many assumptions into it. And you can see how that comes crashing down during a pandemic when our natural world order is just turned upside down. It's crazy. 
Well, that's so like so insightful. I mean, I'm kind of like my head's racing right now with this idea that, you know, you're right. We hear that all the time. Follow your heart, follow your passions and how it's just so specific and narrow to a very small group of people. And I even sometimes wonder, I mean, in, in some of the developed nations, I mean, I think, you know, I always get the feeling that people really enjoy the, the, the work, the actual physicality of it. Now, I'm sure there's some instances where they don't and it's, it's the conditions aren't great, but they, you know, I, and maybe I'm wrong. And I'd love to get your take on this. I've always had this perception that they're not sitting around saying like, what's my passion and being so indulgent and dare I say, sometimes (laughs) a little arrogant, right? Where we're like, you know, how dare we, you know, sit around thinking about what our passions are when when there's other things to be to be done in terms of work and and survival and sustenance. And passion is important, right? But it's not everything. And, And maybe maybe you just need a job where they treat you fairly and there's an even exchange for the amount of labor you put in. And that's enough, right? It doesn't have to be more than that. I, there's so many things to untangle there. I, it's wrong to mistreat people. It's wrong to not give them equal opportunities. But it's not the job of an employer to keep every employee amused all the time. And what we're going through right now uh, brings it, it, it has this leveling force about it. So we're understanding, for instance, how difficult it is if you don't have basic internet access. We understand how difficult it is if you don't have a spot in your room to work from home. We understand what we're going to miss about working together is just surfacing all of these uh, opportunities to learn what's really important and what's really critical. And I'm grateful for having grown up in, in an era where I learned, I was forced to learn some of those things. And the key for me is when my life gets a lot softer and easier, which it is now, is to still be really deeply grateful for everything I have and not take it so much for granted or assume that I deserve those sorts of things. I don't know. And I I love that too. I mean, do you have any insight on how you, how you keep that that edge about you, how you, how you avoid you or even like your children. Right. Like I, I think of my, me and my kids, I mean, we, we, for lack of a better word, we've gotten soft, you know, we've, right. we, we were, we're indulgent. And do you have any thoughts on, on how to maintain that edge or maintain that, you know, a, a self-awareness maybe, you know, it is, I'm not, I'm not sure. Self-awareness for sure. I've worn out three therapists trying to be more self-aware myself there seems to be a big chunk of our lives and how we spend our money is meant to chase familiarity and comfort and the expected result. And we, we haven't somehow figured out how to be flexible and nimble and accepting of things. And I definitely think that carries over to child rearing for sure. I and mean, we have two grown kids. I'm not saying we were the best parents at all. But I do know that we worked hard at helping them adapt to different circumstances and not rescue them from from some of that. So so understanding also, I I see it when it carries over to how people run their businesses, which is kind of in the business that I am, is is helping people think through how to run their businesses differently. It's uh, you see a real distinct difference here. On the one hand, you have firms that achieve a certain level of success and they work very hard to maintain it and they're disciplined at it and so on. And then you have other firms who don't let their intermediate success keep them from continuing to experiment. They're not afraid of losing some of what they have accomplished in order to press the envelope and gain additional things. Another way to say that is that one of the the biggest hindrances to additional growth for me is the level of success I've already achieved because I don't want to do innately. I don't want to do things that will uh, cause me to lose that or take a step backwards instead of realizing that there's this, there's this cycle you you're going to make significant mistakes, but if you never take Uh, risks, then you're never going to have the upside of those mistakes that you're going to make as well. And I, one of the things that keeps me learning every, or keeps me excited about being in every day is the fact that I get to learn and, and experience and think and articulate. And that's what keeps me alive, or at least to the extent that I am alive. (laughs) Yeah. And, you know, it, it just makes me think that 
this idea of continually pushing, continually experimenting and, and pushing ourselves. I mean, when, when you apply that to the businesses you work with, which are primarily creative firms, like, like, like how does that look? Like what, what are ways that you've seen it both work well and also not work well? Yeah, the probably the biggest, most widely seen mistake that firms that I that I work with make is is their positioning. So they craft a positioning that's as broad as possible so that in their minds they can consistently turn those opportunities into into work, into money. And they're against this notion of narrowing their opportunity and digging deeper in there because they're afraid that throughout the history of their business and then also when they look back on their business, their biggest fear is, oh, I didn't have enough opportunity. And so they craft their positioning and their service offerings such that it's wide open. We're, we're open for business. We're a full service firm. Whatever you need, you just tell us, we'll figure out how to do that for you and make money in the process. And because of this, this uh, terror they have, there's a run of opportunity, they don't experience the deepness, the richness that comes from expertise. And that's where my work with experts comes into play. And it is sad because you look, just pretend for a second uh, with yourself or myself, let's say I'm looking, let's say it's me and I'm older, I'm on the, say I'm in the last third of my life and I decide to get reflective for a moment and I look back over my life and say, you know what, David, you really didn't meet your potential. Why is that? And I'll be faced with a couple of options. One of those is, well, David, is it because you didn't have enough opportunities? And that is just never the case, not in the world that you and I live in or your listeners live in. Their opportunity is everywhere. We live in the land of freaking opportunity. It's like it never runs out. No, that is not why I will not have been as successful as I could have been. It will be because I wasn't choosy enough. I didn't say no enough to many of those opportunities and then buckle down and master something. And so you have to buckle down and master something, but you bring a broader context to it so that you're not just a weirdo. And that broader context is all of the interests that are in your life that you're constantly exploring. But when it comes to making money and charging people for things, you need to be an expert, right? And and that's the the one area that it seems like experts tend to really struggle with. Yeah. And why do you think that is? I think it's their fear of opportunity. They think they're going to run out of opportunity. Whereas people, I look at my life, I've been successful enough at what I do. Uh, there's still stuff left on the table for sure. And I've been more successful than a bunch. So I would just say it's successful enough, right? But but this, what I do for a living doesn't define me. I There are 15 other things I could have done and I could have been successful enough at any of those things. So this isn't, so it, and if if you feel that way about your career, then you're not as worried about wasting it. You're not as worried about making a mistake and like, oh, shoot, I shouldn't have done that because you feel like, what's the worst that can happen? You kind of lose your career and you start another one. It's, um, we're all wrapped up in this sense of who we need to be and how we have to protect what we have. And I've always felt like, successful people are one or maybe two really significant mistakes away from being homeless again. And so if you picture yourself at that point, what would happen to your psyche if you were homeless? Would you be okay? I'd be okay. I would climb back from it. So I'm not going to work at protecting everything I have. I'm going to work at continuing to learn and experiment and take risks. Well, you know, thank you for that. There's just like so much to unpack, at least as far as for, I'm concerned. You know, I'm I, I'm admittedly one of those people that has bought into the narrative that you know you you need to find your life's work, you need to find your calling, and thereby when you do that, it wraps all this emotion into your work. And to your point, it, it becomes your identity and who you are. And when you have a misstep at work, that becomes a misstep that you wear personally. It it, it creates baggage around your story. And so this idea of enjoying, appreciating, dare I say, even loving your work, that that's okay, but there has to be a limit to it. And, you know, any thoughts or ideas on how to distance yourself from it, or is it simply just mindset? 
I think one of the characteristics of some of the best thinkers and doers are they don't have this one, two, or three people or firms that they want to emulate. They know what those quote unquote best firms do. And there are certain elements of it that they think about and might want to emulate and so on, but they, they charge forward and they blaze a new trail, often borrowing from the best practices of sister sort of industries and say, I'm going to be different in a lot of, a lot of ways. And that's going to make it easier for people to distinguish between me and my competitors it will make it easier for me to develop unique insight, maybe make it easier for me to develop my own IP. So there's something about looking ahead and continuing, continually reinventing yourself as opposed to looking next to you to see what other people are doing and worrying about whether you're losing ground to them as if it's some big comparison game. We, most of your listeners, I would imagine are in North America, maybe some in Australia or Europe. and But we live in a place where uh, the opportunity is just staggering. And, and the freedom we have to invent ourselves and get other people to give us money so that we can keep doing the things we're really good at. What an era in history for that to happen, right? And, and it's a shame to waste that and not to continually build innovation into the way you approach your work. That's that's one of the core messages I hope people will take. Yeah, and, and it's crazy to think, just to your point, that we can just invent different things and 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 kind of come up with new businesses and 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 offer different different points of advice. So, you know, I, I do want to go back a little bit to where you were in Costa Rica and you said it was 10th grade and you came back to the States and, uh, where did you land? Like, what what, what was that like? Uh, Did you just kind of reintegrate into society and away you went or like, what was that all about? I reintegrated not very well. I would say it was pretty awkward. I went to a, a school called Ben Lippin high school. It was in Asheville, North Carolina. It was this private boarding school of about 200 kids across four grades most of them were, uh, their parents were expats, they were ambassadors or they were MKs, that kind of thing. So all of these people came from different backgrounds and it wasn't all that odd there because there wasn't any norm. But when I got out into society, it was, yeah, it was pretty strange. It was weird. I I didn't want to head down the uh, medical missionary path that my parents were. I wanted to teach in an academic setting so I, you know, finished high school, went to college, did five years of full-time graduate work, studying mainly ancient languages. And that's where I was going to head. I was going to teach Syriac, Arabic, Greek, Hebrew, Latin, and so on. And, and uh, about halfway through my graduate work, I looked around at the academic environment and, and realized that for the first time, there wasn't the sort of academic freedom that I had dreamed about. It was, yeah, it was academic freedom to do anything you want as long as you end up here at this place. And and that world has gotten even more polarized and and progressive leaning than before. And I just felt like, okay, this just isn't going to work. There isn't going to be this sort of academic freedom that I really craved. So, but I was far enough into the program that I decided I, I really needed to finish that. But then I'm sitting here wondering, okay, what am I going to do when I finish? And I looked around I, to fund my way through school. I was um, managing an academic bookseller, doing editorial work there. Decided to start an agency just because the examples of communications that I saw were really poor. And I just didn't think it would be that difficult to improve that world. Didn't know anything about it. and Never worked at any of those firms. Didn't know anybody that worked at one of those firms. So it was trial by fire and learning. So this was a firm that we started, ran it for six years, about 16 people. It never got really big. And it was a great learning experience. My So I ran the firm, started the firm, ran the firm, and I did most of the copywriting, which was kind of a natural progression from my love of words and and the research side. And that's how I got into this field. And then from there, it was a really strange set of circumstances. I I was invited to help to to um, advise some of my peers 
And I didn't really have all that much to add. It wasn't that I was running an amazing firm, but I did learn really quickly what was working in their lives. And, and I was able to share that with additional people as well. So over a six month period, I switched from running an agency to helping other people run an agency. And and then the next iteration was really working across professional services and helping experts think about how to run their firm. So it's been a long, I never could have charted this path. And I see the, I see the stepping stones looking back, but I certainly, the many of those steps were not intentional. I just simply was in the right place and saw how uh, this next iteration of my life could use something that I've enjoyed doing in the past. And I think Steve Jobs said, you can't really connect the dots moving forward, but you can connect the dots looking back. And that's definitely true for my experience. Yeah. And so to some degree, it sounds like you were following your passion in a way, or you're following your heart, um, certainly with uh, there being an economic outcome to it um, and mm -hmm. not just being willy nilly. I mean, would that be accurate to say at that time you were just seeing where things took you? Yes, for sure. You know, but along the way, th there are things that I would probably love doing more than I'm doing now, but there is not an economic value to them. So it's a mix. There's no disadvantage in loving your work. In fact, it's fantastic if you love your work. And I really love most of my work, but that's not the only criteria. So you think about somebody who loves riding bikes all the time. And they love it so much, they decided to quit their job and and open a bike shop. Well, running a bike shop, it requires completely different skills than running a bike, than riding a bike and enjoying that. So it's just, you know, it's there's a difference between <laughs> turning your passion into a business and loving the work that you do. Yeah, a little known fact to all the listeners out there. Uh, my father didn't quit his job, but he did love riding bikes and he did start a bike shop and it went terribly bad so <laughs> yeah, right. yeah he wasn't he didn't, know, he didn't really know about running businesses and he didn't know about running a bike shop so there you go it's a good example very uh, poignant I, I appreciate that yeah <laughs> and so what were some of those things or, or or are some of those things that you kind of alluded to that you love but aren't economically viable for you well i love flying i fly airplanes and helicopters I and I was a corporate pilot for one brief stint of a, a year and a half. But you don't kind of you don't have the impact that you would like. You don't make the money that you'd like. I love woodworking. I love photography. I've done that professionally, but it's only the top one percent of photographers, you know, make a million dollars a year. So those are the so you just kind of relegate those to hobbies, right? And say, oh, this I've learned a lot from this. This is I'm so glad I have this experience, but I'm not going to turn it into a business. I'm going to have a business that thousands of people would recognize has a value, and they consistently want to pay me good money for me to speak to their situation. And that's that's a great business idea. Now, I'm not talking about a B2C business. I'm talking about a B2B professional services business, the area I speak to. But that's that's how my thinking unfolds on that. Yeah. And I just kind of want to let that hang out there a little bit, because I do just think that is such an important insight for people to understand that, you know, at the end of the day, like, you know, most of our businesses are not dot orgs and we do need to make money and we do have, uh, you know, we need to bring in income and, and, and things like that. And so it can't all just be this kind of fantasy that the narrative, I think there's a narrative out there that, you know, much the way you started this, do what you love and everything will follow. And it's going to be this amazing sort of uh, Nirvana lifestyle. And it just, it just isn't that way. And I think you sharing your experience really highlights that and, and some of the choices that we need to make as, as creatives and business owners. Yeah. And as a business owner, you know, life is not, my goodness, it, how many people come up to you and admire your life as an entrepreneur but at the same time, have no idea what it really takes to be successful. You Like the risks you take when you sign a long lease or you take out a line of credit, the difficult, challenging conversations you've got to have with some of your team members, the pressure you feel at night if you're about ready to lose a client relationship that's important to your business. It's not all roses, right? But all of those things together make you the sort of intelligent, resilient, hopeful person that you are as an entrepreneur. And what a life you can have if you approach it from the perspective of, 
being grateful for it, being disciplined, and being flexible about what this business is going to bring to you. It's, uh, I'm really grateful to be a part of this world. Yeah. And, and I think you may have alluded to it, but do you have like a regular gratitude practice that you partake in? I don't. I probably should. And I've, I've learned about some ways that I could do that, but gratitude is something that's a part of my life regularly. And I, I probably stop and think about it. It's not programmed into my day, but I probably think about it anywhere from two to half a dozen times a, a day, I would think. And and it just helps me relax and stop the craving and and recognize that wow while this while this is here while I can enjoy this while I'm on this vacation or while I'm enjoying this particular new thing I bought or whatever it is I'm going to really appreciate it but it it could all go away too and I'll be fine yeah and, and I'll, I'll reflect back I think you do have a gratitude practice it just comes easy to you and yeah, part of your right. innate maybe <laughs> yeah your innate personality and so you know I I think you do this episode brought to you by Wild Story. Wait, isn't that your company? It is. And without the generous support of Wild Story, this show would not be possible. A brand isn't a logo or a tagline or even your product. A brand is a person's gut feeling about a product, service, or company. It's what people say about you when you're not in the room. Wild Story helps progressive founders and savvy marketers build purpose-driven brands that connect their business goals with the customers they want to serve so that both the business and the customer needs are met. This results in crazy, happy, loyal customers that purchase again and again, and this is great for business. If that sounds like something you and your team might want to learn more about, reach out at www.wildstory.com and we'd be happy to tell you more. Now back to our show. You know, I keep thinking back to those that early part of your career where you're describing, um, you know, starting your own firm, then being asked to help, you know, advise on other firms. At what point did you first feel like an expert or know that you were an expert? Yeah. So I was, I subscribed to a publication called Creative Business. It was run by Cam Foote out of Boston. And part of the deal was that your subscription included the ability to call him and ask any question. I think it was his way of staying in touch with the marketplace so I would do that from time to time. And one day I said, hey, Cam, why don't you why don't you provide advisory services to your subscribers? I think they would be really open to getting deeper personalized advice from you. He wasn't interested at that point, but he said, why don't you do it? And I, I, I that had never occurred to me at all. And before I could even respond to him, he said, let's put an ad in my publication. I will, I'll do it for free, but you just give me 10% of everything you make. I didn't think much would come of it, but oddly enough, people started calling. And the first call I got was this, I was living in Northern Indiana at the time. And the first call I got was from this firm in Chicago. So I went out to buy some new clothes. I drove my really nasty car, parked it quite a ways away so they wouldn't see it. And for some reason, they were drawn to what they thought they could learn from me. And they said, well, if we decide to work together and we think we'd like to, what, how would you package your service? And I made up a service on site and they said, how much will it cost? And I made up a price at the top of my head as if I'd been doing this for years. And as I drove home, that was the first time I felt like, oh, I could be an expert. I have been paying attention to running my own firm. I've learned from my mistakes and I've learned from what other people have done well. And they want an outside perspective on how to do it better. I can help them and they are willing to pay me money for that. Wow, that feels really strange. So that was the very beginning of it for me. And since then, it's been a long winding road through expertise with highs and lows, you know, mixed with standing in front of 5,000 people live on TV and feeling like I'm completely nailing it to other times being embarrassed because I don't have the answer to a question at the end of a presentation and letting all of those different experiences shape who I am and drive me forward. 
Yeah. And, you know, and you've written a book called The Business of Expertise. I love it. Uh, I've read it twice now. Uh, it's dense. You know, there's a lot of great, it's easy to read and I don't want to make it sound like it's not, but there's just, a, it's like every page is packed with information. And one of the things uh, that I really took from it and, and loved about it was that you describe, in one instance, you describe that for you being an expert or the definition of being an expert is being able to stand up and, you know, give a, give a keynote, give a webinar, and then stand up and take questions and feel like you're in the pocket, so to speak, you know, that right. you can take whatever comes your way. But it was really interesting to hear you even just mention in that last, uh, that last little segment that like, sometimes you don't always have the answer, but I think it's, and, and please, uh, you know, let me know if I've got this right. I think it's the confidence to stand there anyways and, and, and get involved in that conversation that really helps to define what an expert or who an expert is. Yeah, right. Exactly. And that, it's a good way to say it because let's say that there were two questions that the crowd asked that you kind of mumbled your way through and didn't have a clear articulate answer right off the top of your head. Well, instead of being discouraged about that, I mean, you have to acknowledge that you kind of blew it right there. Probably not as many people noticed it as you think they did, but use that to drive you forward. And so now the next task at hand is figure out what your point of view is on those two things where you mumbled the answer. And, and that's where the continuous learning takes place and where, and then if you begin to publish that, all of a sudden you stand out from the other experts who are just burdened in their day-to-day -day solving of client questions and are not carefully articulating their point of view on things and, and making that public. Yeah. And so what's hard about being an expert? What don't we know that we, we haven't talked about so far? It's hard to be an expert because... Uh, the kind of advice that you're giving, it's hard to separate it from who you are as a person. So if somebody doesn't respond well to your admonitions, your advice, then it, it's pretty easy to take it personally. The other thing is that the inner critic is uh, frequently beating, you know, tapping you on the shoulder and saying, you're really not worth that much money per day or that person paid you this much and you solved their issue in in two phone calls over an hour and 45 minutes, you really think that you should have charged them that kind of money? Or am I still as relevant as I was 10 years ago? You know, I think experts are really good at constantly beating themselves up. <laughs> That's why they keep learning because they're so paranoid about losing their edge. At least, or maybe I'm just Maybe this is just a whole string of confessions for me and other people don't feel that way, but, but that's certainly how I feel. Yeah, no, I, I feel that too. And I was so hoping actually here on my little notes, I was going to get into the, this idea of relevance. And so I'm so glad that you brought it up because I do think about relevance in so many ways, you know, everything from, you know, just the, the basic, am I still relevant is what I'm talking about. Still, still timely, you know, are people learning it in a different way? Everything to, as I grow older, I worry about relevance. And so how do you continue to just just tackle this idea of relevance and stay relevant. And I love I love in uh, in in your book. You, I think I'll paraphrase, but it says something to the effect is it is <laughs> to to ask about relevance it assumes that you were relevant at one point, anyways. In the so, first place, yeah, in yeah. the first place, right. yeah. So uh, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll assume that. <laughs> yeah. Well, you don't typically work hard at relevance unless irrelevance is terrifying to you. So if you aren't putting yourself, if you aren't standing naked in front of people frequently, then you don't have a, enough incentive to be relevant because you can just take the same lame average clients that come to you who aren't pressing the envelope and asking really tough questions and critiquing how you deal with them and so on. So, you know, I, I, I guess another, I don't mean this to be cute, but the the biggest driver for relevance to me is knowing what irrelevance feels like. It's constantly being at the edge of irrelevance and being willing to reinvent myself all the time, which means I'm going to throw away some things where I have gotten very comfortable in leading client relationships because they're slipping in relevance. And 
that's a lot of hard work. It's not the easiest. The easiest thing is just to keep mailing it in and doing the same things without adapting along with the world. Look at how Google Google's presence has changed how we work and how we think about expertise and how that carries over to our lives. You think about expertise now, it's it's basically free, it's immediate, and it's very specific, those three things. So in a world where that is what defines expertise, how in the world am I going to carve out a place where I can charge X amount per day, right? So it's, I love those innate tensions that come with it. And after I figure this tension out, there'll be other ones that'll just be slipping in from all angles, trying to cut my feet out from under me. That's the kind, you have to be willing to be in that fight regularly or, or you're just going to slowly die. Yeah, I, I I couldn't agree more. And, and, you know, and you mentioned this idea of like, you know, you have to stand up and, and be, you know, willing to be critiqued and to be questioned by clients. Like, how do you handle that when that happens? I mean, I always find that to be like one of the hardest things, you know, like you don't want to be argumentative and defensive. You want to hear them and you want to take it because a lot of times that can make you better. But then I sometimes feel vulnerable and that like, Hey, I got to like prove that I'm the expert here. So like, how do you recommend or how do you personally handle that? I don't handle it very well in the sense that I have to work really hard to uh, soften my natural reactions to it. I get my feelings hurt pretty easily. My podcast partner, uh, Blair Inns, taught me something that helps me a lot. And and he said, all right, David, uh, are you afraid of the truth? And of course, it's stupid to say you're afraid of the truth. So no, I'm not afraid of the truth. I, I want the truth. So Part B of that is, okay, if you want the truth, if you're not afraid of the truth, then wouldn't it be better to know the truth as soon as possible so that you can make adjustments? And yeah, I'd have to say I agree with that, right? Uh, And even when somebody's critique is not wrapped well, it's uh, it's full of either a personal attack or uh, them not looking at themselves or whatever that is. I still think as an expert, you owe it to your own development to find the nugget of what's true and embrace it without defending yourself. And then don't over apologize for it, but but do acknowledge in, a, in as a defenseless way as possible, which means you're probably going to, if you're writing an email responding to somebody like that, you're probably going to have to rewrite it four times and then you send it and you reread it later. And it's like, ah, that was good that I acknowledged the truth of that. And I wanted to learn, but I'm still holding fast to some of the things that I believe that maybe, maybe the real issue is that they just don't want to accept those statements that I'm making. And instead they're falling back on how those were delivered. We, we, having said all that, as experts, I think you need to worry a little bit less than is normal about how those things are delivered. The deeper your expertise, the less important how you deliver those things are. I always think of that TV show, Dr. House, who had the worst bedside manner of, of, of all, but he still had a thriving practice because he was so good at what he did, people overlooked that. So there's a mix here. You don't have to be uh, sweet order takers all the time. You can afford to be a little bit bristly, but you don't want to do anything that unnaturally distracts from the good that you could be accomplishing with your clients. Yeah, I, I like that. <laughs> the bigger expert you are, you can you can you don't have to be as nice. I, I, I totally totally agree. And you know, before I, I ran into a lot of the work you were doing around positioning and content and, and you and, and, and your podcast partner, Blair, you know, I used to like, I just kind of believed in this narrative that like expertise just sort of happens, you know, and that people just either fell into it or like, it, it was just like kind of this, this thing that organically happened and you have these experts. But what I've really got from your teachings and, and a lot of your content and your books and, and things like that is that expertise and becoming an expert is really an intentional act. Like you have to like really think about it and work towards it. Uh, pr- pr- presuming that is accurate, you know, how, how would, would you advise that people really take those first steps and, and start their way to becoming an expert as far as the way you define it? Yeah. The core of that developing expertise comes from noticing patterns. And probably the biggest mistake that 
would be experts make is that they don't narrow their positioning enough so that pattern matching is possible. So I only work with certain kinds of expert firms, which means that I can easily compare them and learn from that experience and see those patterns and write about them and so on. So that would be the first thing is to make sure that your positioning is narrow enough so that pattern matching is possible. And then the second really critical component, I just can't see developing expertise without this thing as well. And that's to begin articulating what you think. It doesn't, the order isn't uh, figure it out and then articulate it. That's not how it happens. It's the, the clarification, the clarity comes in the articulation. So you just have to commit to doing that. So there are 40,400, I looked it up this morning, 40,400 people have signed up to get my weekly email. And the, uh, the way my workflow is, I've got to come up with a consistent stream of ideas to write about, at least one, sometimes two a week. And there are, at different stages at the moment, about 370 different topic ideas. And you would think that after doing this for 25 years, you'd begin to run out of things to talk about, but it's the opposite. I, I've i never had more things that I could talk about, and that will continue. I'll, I'll be very sad when I stop this because I'll, I won't have an outlet for these ideas. So the deeper you dig the more there is to see and the more there is to think and talk about. And if you aren't committed to, if there's back to this education thing with young kids, if there was one thing I would try to encourage my kid to do, that would be to write, to keep a journal, to have a blog as a nine-year-old, whatever it is. I just want them to continue. I want them to think out loud because it just doesn't happen well unless there are other people listening. And then, so... From what I heard there, starting the path to effectively thinking out loud, developing expertise in your specific area, and then putting it out on some sort of platform, whether that be, right. you know, you mentioned your list. Uh, I know you have a podcast. I mean, you're, you're very active with your thought leadership. You know, there's it, probably no way people can't um, learn about you or what you're talking about, depending on the way they consume content. Right. Yeah. And, and the fear of irrelevance, um, the fear of looking stupid, the fear of not having enough business, those three fears should be enough to drive you to keep doing better and to keep going deeper and deeper. And if you love the process of learning, then business development is not a chore. It's the core of what you do. And the fact that clients are willing to pay you money to get inside your head and see what you're learning is just a complete bonus. That's why I just feel so grateful for the, the being a knowledge worker, so to speak. Yeah, and can you expand a little bit on that business development comment? I know a lot of people, it is a chore and a lot of people dread it and it is, it's hard work. Um, I talked to people, I was just talking to someone this morning about that and they were, they were reflecting that to me. So uh, can you expand on that just a little bit more about how to not make it so? Yeah, well, for me, the fact that I have... 40 some thousand people listening, so to speak, is uh, it's just this privilege. It's this responsibility I have. But really, they're just along for the ride as I keep learning more and more. So when I have to, that's how you would normally think about it. When I have to write another insight piece and send it out to all these people, it's not a chore. It's I, oh, I can't wait to quit doing something for these clients because now I'm going to get a chance to go back to school again and learn something new. And this will be one more tool in my toolbox that I'll be able to use with clients who pay me money. So for me, it's an opportunity to learn. It's not a chore. It's an opportunity to learn. And if your lead generation plan isn't designed like that, then you need to redesign it. If Instead, you think lead generation is calling eight people, cold call calling eight people today, then you've got the wrong plan because you're not excited about it. If you're not excited about your lead generation plan, it's not going to get done, right? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's 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 hard work. Um, if it's if it's 
a chore. <laughs> right. And, and it's, and it's the work of your, it's the easy work. It's the stuff that we gravitate towards. And I can speak to myself. Like I wake up in the mornings and I, uh, I can easily write uh, a thousand uh, to 2000 words, or I can come and show up to this podcast and I could do it all day long. Uh, but to your point, co- cold calling is just <laughs> no fun. Right. And so, uh, it, to be shy away from that kind of stuff. Perfect. And so David, you know, as we get into a new, I don't even know, like a new era of business. I mean, things are changing. And I think that, you know, everyone realizes that, that the way we do business is, is having a significant shift. What does that mean for the business of expertise? Where do you see this going and what significant changes do you think uh, you're going to see coming up here in the next, let's call it six to 18 months? Well, the pandemic has certainly changed things in the sense that none of my in-person events are happening. And then 90% of my engagements were in, were in person as well. So I viewed this with a little bit of terror for a couple of weeks. And then, and then for me, it was like, oh, this is great. This is forcing me to reinvent how I deliver this stuff. So let's build a, a professionally switched TV studio with a fiber optic line. And that way, the production value will support this sort of fees that I need to get for to continue working with my clients. That's part of it. The other is just how the world, all of a sudden, the idea of the world changing slowly is out the window, right? And so we need to be resilient businesses that have as few single point of failures as possible. We need to have them run well so that we have enough money to pivot We need flexible arrangements with our people. We need to be selling something that doesn't require a dependence on supplier relationships that's in our heads, that's insight, that can continue to be given. We we can't ignore positioning and lead generation because when you try to spin that flywheel up, it takes six, nine, 12 months to spin it up. So it needs to always be running so that when you call on it at a moment's notice, it's already there. There's so many great lessons. Yeah. And as we go you know, into the pandemic, it's hard to think where this will go. And I, I really resonate with this idea that I think everyone felt this, this moment and feels probably still this moment of despair that my world's been turned upside down. But I also really resonate with your, you know, kind of realization like, Hey, here's an opportunity to do things differently. And, and I really implore those listening to think about how can you do what you do and deliver it differently. And if you can't, you might have to start making some hard decisions about your business. And I will say, David, that uh, I was on your webinar, I think last Friday, and uh, there was this quick moment where the, it was like a kind of behind the scenes peak as you were getting ready. And I was very uh, envious of your studio. It looked very uh, oh. awesome. <laughs> and it was very, very ah, cool. Thank you. Uh, l- looks good. So, you know, as, as we come to a, a close here, David, you know, when you think about where where you've come and, and becoming an expert and and where you're going, if you were to look back and if you were to run into uh, eight year old David back in, in, in Costa Rica, what do you think he'd say if he saw you now? Well, I think he'd be proud of uh, the fact that somebody who was um, unaware of so many cultural taboos and normal ways of working kind of learn to adapt. And I think he'd be proud. You know, I, I feel like I basically have accomplished some good things, but there's so many things left to do. So I don't know. I don't think his expectations were all that high at the moment um, back then. Um, so I think he'd be pleased. Thank you. And where where can people and our listeners learn more about you, potentially sign up for that list? We'll certainly link to that in the show notes. But if you want to go ahead and let people know where they sure. can learn more about David C. Baker, please go ahead. Uh, so the book, the fifth book uh, called The Business of Expertise, that uh, you can find at expertise.is, expertise.is uh, website. And then if you want to know more about my advisory business, it's davidcbaker.com. And that'd be the easiest place to sign up for those free emails. And that is David C. Baker. I love what he said about staying relevant and continuing to experiment challenge ourselves, and keep pushing the envelope. If you're feeling too comfortable, perhaps you need to start thinking deeper. 
and writing more. I also agree with his assessment that the greatest skill anyone can have in today's and the future business economy is thinking. How to think and how to articulate it. If any of this resonated with you, I highly recommend his book, The Business of Expertise, which we will link to in the show notes for easy reference. Thank you again to David C. Baker. Remember, becoming an expert is an intentional act and not something that just happens. Go out and be the expert I know you can be. Well, that's the show. Until next time. Make sure to visit our website, www.wildstory.com, where you can subscribe to the show in iTunes, Stitcher, or via RSS, so you'll never miss an episode. I like big stories and I cannot lie. You other storytellers can't deny. 